If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139, and as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Loudoun and Prince William and Montgomery County and Arlington and others online. It's good to be together around God's Word, especially on this weekend when we celebrate and thank God for the freedoms we enjoy, and particularly across our church family as we were just praying here at Tyson's for the many people in our church family who either serve now or have served in specific ways to protect and defend and promote those freedoms. So it's, it's good to set aside time like we do over the next couple of days to celebrate those freedoms, even as we turn our attention today to a word that speaks to all nations throughout all time. So if you were here last week, I was out of town and I sent a video from a fairly windy canyon uh, sharing how I was rearranging some of my travels to be back here this Sunday, today, specifically to address this historic moment in our nation when Roe versus Wade has been overturned by our Supreme Court to see what God's Word says. To see what God's Word says to us in moments like these and how God's Word directs us to think and live. So I I should mention, I realize some of you may have your kids with you in worship today as we're talking about abortion. I've tried my best to keep everything age appropriate. uh, But if for any reason you feel uncomfortable with your children or just aren't ready to dive into this conversation with them, please feel free to step out. We totally understand that. And... I should also mention that I hope you know by now that our, our pastors here and I are not interested in promoting a political party or personality. No matter what that costs me or us, we have one desire to promote Jesus alone and to proclaim only that which comes from his word. So I would say from the start, please... Please make sure everything I share today is directly grounded in God's Word, that you can see a direct line to God's Word that's clear and that's cloaked, I hope, in God's love and tenderness and compassion and hope. And I say that because I, I think more than any other time I've addressed this issue over many years in preaching, today I feel the sensitivities and emotions and questions and concerns that I know are represented around this gathering with followers of Jesus from so many different backgrounds and perspectives, even places, some right now in more rural northern Virginia, some who live in the district, some who live in Maryland, some who are not even followers of Jesus. You're exploring Christianity. Some of you may actually be opposed to Christianity, but you're here for a number of reasons, maybe with family or... Well, regardless, we want you to know you're welcome here for whatever reason. And as I was praying in anticipation for this gathering today, so many different ones of you came to my mind. So I know that some, many of you are overjoyed about the Supreme Court's decision It's a moment you've prayed and worked and marched and labored for in all kinds of ways, and you have hardly any emotions but joy, which is part of why you might be compelled to clap just a moment ago. And then others of you have that joy, but you're also sobered by the uncertainty that lies ahead in different states, including our states and the district, across our country as animosity, animosity and division only seem to be increasing. And then some of you have that joy, but it's mingled with grief or even anger in light of some of the tactics and personalities in our political environment that have contributed to this ruling. I and other pastors across our church have been intentional to engage in conversations with many this week. And I've heard a variety of people use the same word. They say, I'm conflicted. 
So maybe one way to put it, some of you feel like a victory celebration is in order in light of this ruling. Others of you feel sick at the thought of a victory celebration in light of the damage done in getting to this ruling or even in this ruling itself. So some of you are concerned about this ruling because of your concern for women's health, particularly when you think about abortions that occur when a woman's life is physically in danger or even how some procedures for miscarriages are labeled abortions because they're similar medically. I've heard from women in our, in our church family who've had these procedures and who are concerned not only about their health, but others like them, knowing that research shows the overwhelming majority of abortions don't fall into that category. And many laws prohibiting abortion do provide for women in these situations, but that certainly doesn't mean that consideration is unimportant, which leads to the reality that for so many, this is not merely a political or even a theological issue. It's a very personal issue. Some of you, particularly women, feel like you lost something significant over the last couple of weeks, a right or power or voice or value in some way. Others of you, including many women who work at or volunteer at pregnancy resource centers, are concerned about your safety going to work and volunteer in ways that you haven't been in the past. Others of you are doctors or nurses or social workers who work closely with pregnant women and you see and feel firsthand the deep personal challenges that go with this issue. And others of you have had or participated in an abortion. As I mentioned, maybe some out of medical necessity, others by choice, and others because it was forced on you. And this last couple of weeks has brought to the surface a whole host of hurts and emotions. And then others of you, like the biological parents of most of my children, have a variety of emotions from giving birth to a baby and lovingly, sacrificially, selflessly, and bravely placing that child for adoption. So I could go on and on because I don't presume I've covered everyone or everything, but I trust we realize we're not all coming to this issue today in the exact same spot. So how in the world do I speak in a matter of moments to every single person from every single perspective? And the clear answer to that question is I can't, but God can. And that's one of the things I love about this word and God's spirit, because this word has spiritual power right now to speak to every single person in this gathering in a way that each of our hearts specifically needs. This word has power to comfort where comfort is needed and at the exact same time to convict where conviction is needed and to encourage where encouragement is needed, to change hearts and minds where change is needed. And in all of this, to chart a course for how we, as God's people, need to walk through this moment in our country and our culture. So my hope today is to give us, as a church family, foundations in God's word that will help us as we sit across tables and living rooms and dining rooms with each other and we listen to each other's stories and perspectives with the clear and rock solid word of God holding us together and I want to help us to share this word in a world that desperately needs to hear what God says so I'll go ahead and give you an outline of the rest of this message if you're taking notes and then I want to pause and specifically ask God for help for me and for each one of us in the next few minutes. So I'm going to start with eight affirmations straight from God's word that will lead us into five applications for what we can do in our lives and families and as a church family. And then I'm going to close with one specific action we're going to take today as a church family. And don't worry if you're doing the math, that was 14 points and you are concerned about lunch 
I promise. We're, we're going to start kind of slow. We're going to pick up the pace as we go along. So let's, let's pray. Oh, God, we gather together today to say we don't need to hear the, from the world on this issue. We need and we want to hear from your word. So from all of our different perspectives, we say to you, please do what only you can do by your word and your spirit. We all need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So please do that transforming work in each of us today. Form our minds and our hearts around your word and your love for us and your love for the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So what does God clearly say to us in his word? I'll have these up on the screen. Biblical affirmation number one. A mother's womb holds a person known, loved, and formed by God himself. Meaning personally by God. Our mother, mother's womb holds a person known, loved, and formed by God himself. Psalm 139, which you have in front of you, makes this crystal clear without question. Verse 13 says, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is an amazing description. And the psalmist here didn't even know what we know now. How God takes a little egg and sperm and brings them together. How within two weeks, a human heart is beating, circulating its own blood. Within a few more weeks, fingers are forming on hands and brain waves are detectable. After just six and a half weeks, these inward parts are all moving. Two weeks later, there are discernible fingerprints. There is discernible sexuality. Kidneys are forming and functioning. Then a gallbladder. By the 12th week, all the organs of a baby's body are functional and the baby can cry. All of that within three months, the first trimester, heart, organs, brain, sexuality, movement, reaction, and God on high is doing all of it. So then, to imagine at this moment, during this time period, taking the life God is designing and destroying it, most abortions take place between 10 and 14 weeks of gestation, what's called by some the optimal time for dismemberment or removal. And this biblical picture is not just here in Psalm 139. It's all over the Bible. It's Job 31, 15. Look at the language. God fashioned us in the womb. Job 10, 8 through 11, God's hands fashioned and made us, molded us like clay. He clothed us. He knit us together. Psalm 22.10, he is our God from our mother's womb. John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verse 15, was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. God tells Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, set you apart. Did you hear that? Known by God before the womb. This is all over the Bible. And just 
in case you're not convinced yet, the very word that the Bible uses for a child in the womb, yaled, is the same word that's used for an infant or a toddler, a child outside the womb. In other words, God makes no distinction between a child inside or outside the womb. So why is this so important? Well, one, I would just pause and encourage every single person within the sound of my voice with this reality. This is you. Right where you are sitting. The picture of how God sees life is the picture of how God sees you. Contrary to a world that defines you in all kinds of ways, according to your status or profession or looks or achievements or your social media profile. No, over and above all of this, you are handcrafted by the God of the universe. You are known, loved, personally formed by God in his image. This is who you are. See your dignity here. And do not look elsewhere in this world to replace the dignity you have that is divine at the core. This is who you are. And this is who they are in the womb. And this is so important for the issue of Abortion, because virtually every argument in the abortion discussion comes back to one central question. It's the crux of the whole discussion. What is the unborn? What or who is the who, what or who is in the womb? And once that question is answered, every other question comes into perspective. Because if the unborn is not human then justifications for abortion are unnecessary. If the unborn is not a person, if the unborn is just a part of a woman's body or a non-viable tissue mass or whatever label you may give to it other than being a person, then the discussion is over. But if the unborn is human, then the majority overwhelming majority of justifications for abortion are inadequate. Again, realizing the small percentage of situations where a woman's life is in danger or a woman may have already miscarried and the child in the womb is no longer alive, the overwhelming majority of abortions in our country are done not because of miscarriage or because a mother's life is physically in danger, but because a mother's so-called right to choose is elevated above a child's God-given right to live. And that's the point. God is telling us this is a person, not merely a part of a woman's body, but a person known, loved, and formed by him. Gregory Kukul wrote a little booklet called Precious Unborn Human Persons, and in it he talks about a little girl named Rachel the daughter of a family friend of his. And he says, think of a little girl named Rachel. Rachel is two months old, but she is still six weeks away from being a full-term baby. She was born prematurely at 24 weeks in the middle of her mother's second trimester. On the day of her birth, Rachel weighed one pound, nine ounces, but dropped to just under a pound soon after. She was so small she could rest in the palm of her daddy's hand. She was a tiny, living human person. Heroic measures were taken to save this child's life. Why? Because we have an obligation to protect, nurture, and care for other humans who would die without our help, especially little children. Rachel was a vulnerable and valuable human being. But get this, if a doctor came into the hospital room and instead of caring for Rachel, took the life of this little girl as she lay quietly at her mother's breast, it would be homicide. However, if this same little girl, the very same Rachel, was inches away resting inside her mother's womb, she could be legally killed by abortion. This makes no sense. It's ludicrous if this is a person 
a child in the womb. Like everything, everything revolves around what is happening in the womb. And God is telling us clearly, the womb contains a person made in my image. Which is why the early church from the very beginning, in opposition to first century culture, stood against abortion. The Didache, which contains some of the earliest teaching we have outside of the Bible from the church in the first two centuries, clearly states, you shall not murder a child by abortion, nor shall you kill a newborn. Tertullian, a leader in the church in that time, clearly wrote about Christians in the culture, saying, in our case, murder being once for all forbidden, we may not destroy even the fetus in the womb. Are you seeing this? This is not just an American cultural war. Taking the lives of children created in God's image in the womb was unthinkable in the Bible, has been unthinkable to Christians throughout church history, and should be unthinkable to Christians today. When we realize that a mother's womb contains a person known, loved, and formed by God himself. Which then leads us to affirmation number two. Every single person bears the image of God and possesses value before God. This is Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Three times God says, let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is what it means to be human to be made in the image of God. And this is true for every single child inside the womb and outside the womb, for every single woman and every single man, for every single person, including every single person with any special need. And we heard two Sundays ago about counsel that one of our pastors and his wife were given to abort a child in light of that child's special need. And we have children and adults across our church family with special needs. We actually had a VBS this week. This building here at Tyson's filled with children from all across our locations with special needs, enjoying hearing about God's love for them, playing at a pool day, so many things, and every single one of them bears the image of God and possesses immeasurable value before God. I wrote an endorsement recently for a book written by Johnny Erickson Tata, who's paralyzed from the neck down. And she once wrote, when people learn that most quadriplegics cannot bathe or toilet themselves, feed or dress themselves, they're quick to think, what a poor quality of life. They think a good quality of life means higher pay, good health, or a stable home. Hardly ever does someone associate a good quality of life with disability. But I would argue that I have a great quality of life. True, having to be bathed, dressed, fed, and pushed around in a wheelchair is not easy. But as difficult as it is, I need to remember in whose image I am made. That is what gives me human dignity, not my ability to walk or use my hands or toilet myself. And I want to pass on that encouragement to everyone, no matter what the age or ability. It's why I do everything I can to show the world that life is worth living and that a disability is not a reason to end a person's life. God made us in his image, and that fact alone gives us true human dignity and a reason to exist. No matter what our abilities or disabilities, we showcase in whose image we are made. Yes, my body may be broken, but I am a God reflector. I mirror a God who is pleased to make me in his image. Genesis 1, Oh, friend, we all need to be reminded that we are God's wonderful creation, and our world needs us to be a voice for life for the unborn, the elderly, the disabled, the medically fragile, and the vulnerable, because all people are created in the image of God. Amen. Every single person bears the image of God and possesses value before God. Which means, third affirmation, every single person deserves honor from us. Every single person. And you think about the way this issue has been framed in our culture 
so much of it revolves around honor and dishonor. So much pro-choice rhetoric revolves around honoring women in ways that dishonor and eventually discard a child in their womb. At the same time, so much pro-life rhetoric revolves around honoring the child in a womb while dishonoring various challenges that women face. Meanwhile, God clearly says we must honor both the child in the womb and the woman who carries that child. We've already seen how God honors the child in the womb in many ways that the world does not. We also need to see how God honors women specifically in many ways that this world does not. Women across this gathering, please hear God saying that you are honored in his sight. All over the Bible, we see Jesus championing women in countercultural ways. We don't have time to look at all the examples, but we think of Jesus welcoming Mary alongside him in Luke 10, weeping with her in John 11, defending women caught in sin or accused of wasting a bottle of perfume, Matthew 26, speaking against divorce practices that were leading to the abandonment of women, Mark 10, Matthew 19, which all leads to the reality that when all the male disciples fled, it was women who stayed at the cross and women who first witnessed Jesus' resurrection. In the words of Dorothy Sayers, it's no wonder that the women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. Amen. They had never known a man like this man. And there has never been another, a prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made arch jokes about them, never treated them as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness, praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. There is no act, no sermon, no parable in the whole gospel that borrows its pungency from female perversity. Nobody could guess from the words and deeds of Jesus that there was anything funny about women's, a woman's nature. Jesus honored women, and church, so must we. I have thought often these last couple of weeks, not only of the woman whose physical life might be in danger and is walking through medical complications with pregnancy, but also of the woman who, for a variety of social, relational, or economic reasons, feels like she cannot care well for a child and sees abortion as her only hope. And she's just lost hope in some settings, and she's hurting, and she's seeing so many people, and particularly Christians, happy. God, help us to honor her and every woman in every way that God himself does. Brothers and sisters, we do not have to choose between honoring women or children as our two-party political system seems to imply we must. No, we must honor both women and children and men. And we must even honor those who disagree on this issue. In the words of 1 Peter 2, 17, honor everyone. That pretty much covers it. And just in case they didn't get it then, he says at the end, honor the emperor. The emperor who's persecuting Christians, honor the emperor. Translated, honor even politicians and or presidents and or people you disagree with. God help us in our language, in our posting, in our relationships, not to cancel our neighbors, but to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we share with them the great news that we are all created fearfully and wonderfully by God himself. Every single person made in the image of God deserves honor from us. Fourth affirmation, on a different but absolutely related note, God designs sexual activity exclusively for marriage between a man and a woman. And this is important because in our country, approximately 85% of women 
seeking abortions are unmarried, a reality that beckons us to share and to live out God's good design and clear instruction in all of our lives to flee sexual immorality, to abstain from sexual immorality, all sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman. God knows what he's saying and doing in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. And part of the consequence of our hookup culture and sexual immorality has been death for millions of children in the womb. So to every person in the church, from teenagers to young adults to every age and stage, don't buy the lie that sexual fulfillment is found outside of marriage. When we go outside of God's good design, it costs us and others in ways far beyond what we might imagine. Trust God and his good design. That leads to affirmation number five, also dealing with God's good design on another level. God gives government for the good of people and the legislation of morality, specifically to protect people. This is Romans 13. Follow the language here. Government is instituted by God as a terror to bad conduct. Government is God's servant for the good of people, rightfully carrying out judgment on wrongdoing. It is right, according to God, for government to say that harming another human being is wrong. Yet many people, even in the church, say, well, I I wouldn't have an abortion, but I don't think we should take someone's right to choose away from them. But as we've already seen in God's word, if the womb contains a person known, loved, and formed by God himself, then apart from those rare circumstances that physically endanger another person, we don't have a right to choose to harm this person. Again, you see how God's definition of personhood is so critical to this conversation, and we know from throughout our history as a country and the history of the world, for that matter, that whenever we decide our definition of personhood is wiser than God's, that always leads to justifying all sorts of oppression and evil. There are so many examples of the danger of our defining personhood different than God does. And the choice we're talking about here, based on God's word, is not just about a woman's body. It's about a child's body. And it is biblically good and right for government to protect both. And especially the one who's personhood before God is being denied. I should add here that one of the things that's been helpful for me to learn in conversations about biblical justice is that as a basic rule of thumb, we should work on behalf of the most vulnerable who are being harmed or mistreated. That's true when it comes to abuse. It's true when it comes to racism. Surely it's true when it comes to abortion. So let's step out of a muddled middle road that says, I don't think we should impose morality on someone else and realize that God institutes government for this purpose, the protection of people, and it is right for us to protect all people from harm. Amen. Which leads straight into this sixth affirmation. God requires his people to do justice and love kindness for all people, including children unborn and born, women and men from either gender or with any disability. So much here, the wording straight from Micah 6, 8. God's requirement is that his people do justice and love kindness as we walk humbly with him. We have a whole discipleship resource on justice that applies here just like it applies to racism and all sorts of other issues of, just, of justice. And applied here, we have a responsibility to do justice for the unborn in the womb and for children born out of the womb. 
and for the women and the men who are their parents. So let's think about justice in light of the realities in this issue. Approximately 75% of women seeking abortions live either near or below the poverty line. In one recent survey of 1,000 women who had abortions, over 75% of them said they would have preferred to parent had their circumstances been different. You listen to so many interviews during these days on the news of different women saying, often through tears, that they don't prefer abortion, but they don't see another way out of their circumstances. So yes, let's be thankful for a court ruling, yet let's also realize that court ruling doesn't change those circumstances. So let's work all the more to help women and men in poverty, to work for affordable housing and health care and strong education and economic security for all people. Let's work to prevent substance and or sexual abuse. Let's come alongside women who in an overwhelming majority of cases don't have someone who's willing to help them parent. God requires this kind of work in us. And I mentioned either gender in light of historic numbers of girls who've been aborted in countries around the world because of preferences for boys. I mentioned with any disability, much like we talked about earlier, as one example I trust we know, that a disturbingly disproportionate percentage of children with Down syndrome are aborted. Even though people with Down syndrome, including ones in our church family, are known to be among the happiest groups of people in the world. God help us to do justice and love kindness for all people made in your image. All this leads to two final affirmations. One, God requires his children to believe and speak unpopular truth as we show and express unexpected love. So I trust we realize that the affirmations we're walking through go directly against the grain of the lies our culture is selling about everything from who a person is to what it means to be made in God's image to what it means to honor others to where sexual activity should take place the kind of justice we must work for, these truths from God's word go against all kinds of ways that our sinful natures are wired to think. So we must fight to believe God's word in our own minds and hearts and then to speak it. Ephesians 4, 15, speaking truth, even when that truth takes us out of step with the world around us. So I wrote a, a whole book about this called Counterculture, just to summarize what I said at the start of that book. As followers of Jesus, we have two options in our culture on issues like this. We can retreat or we can risk. We can retreat in a variety of ways. In the name of progressive faith or inclusive belief or open minds, we can slowly trade in the truths of God's word for the changing opinions and trends in our world. Or we can retreat from the culture around us. We can hold Christian convictions and just stay silent with them in public settings. Maybe just hear about these realities and do nothing about them, move on with our lives, business as usual. Or we can stand up and speak out and act on issues where we'll be commended by our particular social group while we sit back and stay silent on issues that will be costly in our particular social group. We can retreat in any or all of these ways. Or we can risk. We can step into these issues believing God's word and speaking it even when it's unpopular while showing and expressing God's love in ways that are unexpected. God, may it be said of your church during these days in our country that we are the most kind and compassionate and tender and sacrificially loving people for moms and dads in pregnancy. And for women who've had abortions, 
and for all kinds of women and men who disagree with what the Bible teaches. May we be known for God's word on our lips and God's love in our lives. Which leads directly into affirmation number eight. Jesus commands his church to accomplish a great commission, not to win a political election or even achieve judicial decisions. Like, yes, as we've seen and said, we desire, we work for just laws and leaders and policies and practices, what we might call just systems and structures on behalf of the unborn and women and men. And at the same time, we know that our main aim as a church is not ultimately new laws, as good as they may be. Our main aim is new hearts. It's what we say to each other at the end of all of our worship gatherings. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and tell people about the God against whom we have all sinned, but who has come to us miraculously as a baby in a mother's womb to show us how to live with love and kindness and perfect obedience to God's word who died on a cross to pay the price for the sins of everyone who would trust in him, who rose from the dead in victory over sin and the grave so that anyone who trusts in him will not only be forgiven of all their sin, but filled with his spirit to experience entirely new life as a new creation in him. Oh, to all who hope in abortion, to all who hope in laws of government or rulings of courts, to all who hope in anything in this world, know this, there is a hope that transcends everything in this world. This hope has a name. His name is Jesus, and Jesus alone can satisfy your soul. Jesus is the greatest need in our country. Jesus is the greatest need in the world. All people need to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus and then to walk in his ways and according to his word. And this is disciple-making. So yes, 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 we praise and thank God for almost... 50 years of work to bring about a change in our country, yet I trust we realize human hearts are still the same today as they were a couple of weeks ago. And many states will continue abortions, and many legislators will continue to push abortion, and abortion pills are becoming all the more easy and accessible to get in all kinds of ways. And whether in abortion or other issues, we will continually invent new ways to do evil. So what are we supposed to do over the next 50 years then? The same thing we should have primarily been doing over the last 50 years, making disciples of Jesus, leading people to life in him and helping them to live and each other to live according to his word. And I use the word primarily there very intentionally. We need to ask ourselves, are we giving the same level of energy to the Great Commission that we give to political efforts or arguments? Do we feel the same levels of emotion when it comes to leading people to Jesus that we have when it comes to supporting a political position or candidate or posting our opinions on social media. So many have done so much in the social and political realm. The question we all need to ask is, who have we led to Jesus? In such a way that they are now leading others to Jesus. This is the commission given to us by Jesus. Even on this issue, our aim is not merely for abortion to be illegal in government. Our aim is for abortion to be unthinkable in people's hearts and minds 
And only God, by his grace and the work of his spirit in human hearts, can bring that about through disciples of Jesus, making disciples of Jesus. So what do we do in light of these clear affirmations in God's word? Surely the takeaway is not for us just to think about these and move on with our lives. What is God telling us to do? And here are five ways, and there are actually all kinds of sub-bullets under them, so it's more than five, but I'm going to give them to you. You can obviously write them down, or if it's too fast, come back, listen to it later. They'll be online. If you go to mclanebible.org slash abortion care, you'll see a lot of resources and this sermon in particular. But I really want each of us individually and our families and our church groups as a church family to consider specific ways that we can act individually and all together. So practical application number one, listen and learn. Meaning, understand the reasons behind abortion and spend time with people from different perspectives. Let's make our church groups safe places for people to share on all sorts of levels, including reasons why they may have had an abortion in the past. We love one another well by listening to one another well. And if we're not willing to hear from people who've had abortions or are considering abortion or have stories or perspectives that are different from us, we'll never be able to get to the root of how to work most wisely on behalf of children in the womb and children out of the womb and their moms and their dads. So let's listen and learn. Be quick to listen and slow to tweet and post. Second, let's support and serve women and men with unwanted pregnancies. How many women and men do you know personally who have or have had unwanted pregnancies? Like if we're not involved in others' lives like this, how can we love and work for them and for their unborn children? And serve and support single parents and grandparents who find themselves in positions where there are no parents and they're the primary caregivers. There are so many single parents in our midst right now. So let's be in church groups where we're serving and supporting them in every way we can. Let's be known as a community that's a haven of refuge and love and support for single parents, for grandparents who are often isolated or alone. Church, let's change that. And let's serve and support foster and adoptive families. We'll talk about this more in a minute, but I think of many people in the church, including empty nesters, for example, who can step in and provide needed help to foster or adoptive families. I can personally testify that other people in the church have been instrumental in our family's story along these lines. We couldn't do it alone, can't do it alone, and none of us are intended to do it alone. Third, let's step forward. This is particularly if you have had an abortion to share your burdens from the past with others, to not walk through that journey alone, to reach out to someone in your church group. Or we have lay counselors now at all of our locations. By all means, reach out to counseling at mcleanbible.org. Or if anyone today or in the future finds yourself considering an abortion, please share your struggles in the present with others. We, we've talked about the high, before, about the high percentage of women who have abortions who are actively involved in church. Please, please, please don't feel like you need to walk this journey alone. This is what the body of Christ is and must be about, shouldering burdens and sharing struggles together. I, I would just say on every level, single parents, grandparents, those considering abortion, we want to be family to you. We invite, we urge you to join a church group at your location, a group of people who will be the church to you who will walk with you and serve you and support you and help you and love you like family. It's the design of church groups. Fourth, speak up in two ways. One, before God in prayer. Don't underestimate for a second the role of prayer before God and all that we've talked about today. And yes, speak up before the government as we do justice and work for just laws and leaders and policies and practices in all kinds of ways we've described, including but not limited to laws specifically pertaining to abortion. Then fifth, reach out. And there are so many ways this can and 
needs to play out across the church. Reach out through working for justice in high-risk communities so that the factors that lead to abortion are addressed. If we don't address root issues of poverty and sexual activity and substance abuse and sexual abuse and affordable housing and health care and on and on, then we're just putting Band-Aids on broken limbs. Let's work for justice in high-risk communities. Let's give to work that promotes and promotes, pr- protects and promotes life in the womb and quality of life outside the womb in all kinds of ways. Let's reach out through volunteering at pregnancy care centers, a specific way we can serve and support women and men with unwanted pregnancies. And I mentioned and men because there's a great need for men to serve in care centers, to come alongside men through them, as well as women, caring for them, for their children, helping them make a plan of care for their children. If that is necessary as we reach out through fostering or adopting children, there is so much I could share here and want to share here, but won't for the sake of time and for other reasons. I would just say that as I look around this gathering right now, I see a lot of homes with a lot of love to give. And I see a lot of children and moms and dads who need help and who are asking for help to care for children. And we cannot tell women to have babies if we're not willing to open up our lives and our home to care for those babies when that's needed. And it's needed. It's needed for hundreds of thousands of children in our country right now multitudes more around the world. In true religion, God tells us we'll look after and take care of them with love. I pray that today might be the day that this moment might be the moment when your heart humbly responds to the needs of children with your home. And in all of this, exactly where we landed in our last biblical affirmation, let's reach out through making disciples of Jesus.